Good morning. Greetings to one and all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here because He is Lord, and we're here to give Him first place in our lives and in our week. So thanks for being here today. If you're watching by television or the internet, we welcome you too. This is the First United Methodist Church in Titusville, and I'm Ron Hipwell. And so if you are a first-time visitor here today, uh, we're glad everyone's here, but we want to welcome you too. And the uh, ushers have some coffee mugs available that they would like to give you as gifts. So if you're a first-time visitor, and if you just raise your hand, try to see if I can spot anyone today. Uh, we would like to get those, or I'll see them afterwards, and we'll make sure you get your gift. This is the time to fill in the registration folders that look like this. They're along the center aisles. Please pass them along and return them to the center. And if you have a prayer concern or a praise that you would like to have identified as the worship service unfolds, uh, there are pew cards that are in front of you in the pew racks. They'll be collected during the first hymn. If you can get those ready and pass them to the center, that would be terrific as well. If you are a member of the church finance committee or church council, we have regularly scheduled meetings this coming Tuesday, and so please be prepared for that. And you're going to see a video uh, during the offering about Rock the Lakes. Now, some of you have been hearing about this for a while, but it's getting very close. We're down the last few weeks, and this is a, a special evangelistic event that's going to be held in Erie. And we're going to have more information for you uh, next Sunday as well. But I want you to pay attention to the video in a little while. But right now, I just want to remind you that, uh, that it's absolutely free. So there are no tickets required to go. However, they're expecting a lot of people. And if the main arena fills, you'll have to go watch by a live feed. But we have 20 reserved seats for Saturday night and for Sunday night. And we'll make those available very shortly. Uh, we're trying to get the 20 for the first night on the 27th for youth. And we're trying to get the, our youth group to invite other youth that do, don't know Jesus and to bring them so that this is an opportunity for them to, to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we'll make the 20 for the Sunday night activity available to you by next week. And so they're on a going to be on a first come, first serve basis, but we're reserving the ones for Saturday night for youth. You can still go on Saturday. You just won't get in the reserve section. So, all right. Well, that's the announcements that I have. No one is ready to bolt out here. So let's take a moment and celebrate the fact that we are God's people because of Jesus Christ. We arise and greet him in his name. Right. We want to call your attention to the bulletin or to the screens and let us be called together in worship. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You 
Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Our dear gracious God, we are here today to honor you, uh, to remember that your kingdom is forever, and because of your grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, we have the honor and the privilege to be a part of it through faith in him. And so as we are here to worship you today, may we do just that. Bless us that we would hear you, that we would remember you, and that we would serve you not only here but always, and we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. And I want to invite the children who are here at this time to please come forward and go over to your right-hand side in front of the puppets as heaven's loving hands are here today. Kids, today I want to tell you the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Roar! What was that? Well, anyways, as I was saying, I wanted to tell you the story of... A story? I want to listen too. Can I please? Sure, Robbie. Come on up and listen. Yippee! What story are you telling? The one about Daniel. Oh, cool. Oh, I love that story. It's my favorite one. Wait, who was Daniel? <laughs> Daniel was a man who lived in Babylon. The king of Babylon was his friend. Oh, Daniel was that guy who made the ark, right? No, Robbie, that was Noah. Oh, Noah. Anyways, Daniel would open his window and pray to God three times each day. One day, the rulers of Babylon, who didn't like Daniel, thought of a way to get rid of him. They put him in a box and shipped him to Timbuktu. <laughs> no, Robbie. They went to the king and told him to make a law that everybody had to pray to the king for 30 days. Anybody who didn't pray to the king would be thrown into the lion's den. The king thought it was a good idea, and he agreed. Wait, so when do the lions come in? Roar! What, what was that? I don't know. Uh, well, I guess what happened next to Daniel? Well, Daniel heard about the law, and he went and opened his window. And shouted, hey, everybody run, the lions are coming. No, he prayed like he always did. But wasn't he afraid of being eaten by the lions? No, Robbie, he knew God would protect him. Well, what did the rulers do when they found Daniel praying to God? They went and told the king. He was very sad that he had to let the lions eat his friend. But he ordered the men to throw him into the lion's den. Roar! Uh, and then the lions ate him, right? Yum, 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 yum. <clears throat> no, Robbie. God saved him. He shut the lion's mouth so, he'd, so he couldn't be eaten. The next morning, the king went to see if he was still alive. Was he? Nope. <gasps> Just kidding. <gasps> of course he was. Remember, God kept him safe. Oh, that's good. I'm glad Daniel wasn't an animal cracker. Me too. I hope you enjoyed the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And remember, God can keep us safe just like he kept Daniel safe. Roar! Lion, everybody run! Lion, where? <laughs> Little cake pickles are so cute. All right, kids, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are and what you do, that you're with us always and that you protect us and just help us to live in your plan so that your name is honored. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, uh, you can return to your seats if you're going back to mom and dad, but look at this handsome man. Jerome is going to take the kids to junior church today, so if you want a junior church, follow him. <clears throat> Our families, our friends, our neighbors, even people that we're going to church with. Many are lost without Christ. There's no other way for you to be saved. There's no other way for your sins to be forgiven except through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's an urgency because once you leave this world, you don't have another chance. The chance is here, the chance is now, the chance is today. God loves you. He made you, He created you, He wants to give you the opportunity to choose. choose. There's a world out there that's dying right there at our doorstep. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? I just can't sit back and do nothing.
I told the Lord to take my life and he could spin me however he wanted to spin me. And that night I prayed that prayer, I meant it. Maybe a year or two later, I felt God calling me to go into full-time ministry. I was afraid people may compare me to my father and, and I would always be a disappointment to people. And I just re realized oh, that wasn't my problem. My problem needed to be taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the best of my ability. I want you to know that emptiness in your life, that big hole in your life, only God can fill that. There's power in the gospel. And that's what's important. They could care less what I say. It's about what God says, and it's His gospel. God loved you so much that He sent His Son out of heaven to this earth on a rescue mission. Rescue mission. When you tell a person that Jesus Christ is God's Son, when you tell a person that He shed His blood and He took our sins to the cross, there's Holy Spirit-filled power in that message. When He stretched out His arms, nailed to that cross, he did it because He loves you. We have all these opportunities, but we may not have them tomorrow. The scripture says when you read Revelation that it's going to be more and more difficult as the day approaches. We're losing ground and we're losing it quickly because we're not being attentive to the freedoms that we have. The church has just a little window of opportunity in this country. We got to do something that's bold, something that's different. Let's use our resources, let's use our gifts, our talents to take this gospel message to the ends of this earth. Dear Lord, you have given us so much. We've just heard about that through the video of the price that you paid for our salvation. And so, Lord, we are grateful people. We are grateful that we can give you our lives in service for you to be spent in the way that you will. And we give you our resources as well that collectively uh, we can continue to share this great news of Jesus Christ with the needy Titusville and around the world. So we give these offerings and ourselves to this end in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry. Amen. You may be seated. 
didn't have my mic on there. So this morning we want to get uh, prepared to go to the Lord in prayer, and I have quite a, a stack of cards here, so I want to give attention to those. And uh, the names we're praying for today are Dennis and Priscilla, Anne Marie, Robert, Thelma, Eugene, Paul, and David, uh, for a family, for safe travels, uh, for parents. Also for Chip and Drake Carroll, for our church family, uh, for Renee's Corner, her family, travel, for Pat, Erica, and Joe, uh, those who have recently lost loved ones. Also for the Shrout family, for Walt uh, Moldlin, Chip Drake, and Greg Tracy, for Ashley and Kyle, for Tim, for strength and for guidance for Jessica and Michael, death of parents, for Sally and Connie and John. Praise for uh, that Sandy Wheeling has had the last of her radiation treatments. She's very grateful for that. Uh, praying for Doreen Logan. Uh, also again for Chip and Carol, for the Blair family, uh, for Stella, Laura, Jessica, and Allison Gary. For also for Karen, also remembering uh, Bill, and uh, thanks for uh, to and praise to God and for the doctors who helped to remove the uh, carcinomas. And we're back to the beginning, so let's unite our hearts and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Gracious Father, we thank you that we can be here today. Lord, we know that you reign over all that is. You're the maker of all that is. This is your world, and, and uh, you are overseeing, maintaining your creation. And Lord, you're at work all around us, and you're working in us to bring us uh, into a right relationship with you at all times. So it's not by accident that any of us are here today, but we want what this time is about to be pleasing to you. We want to honor you with not only our lips, but with our lives. We want to honor you in everything that we are and do, not just for an hour here on Sunday or several hours here on Sunday, but every moment of every day. And we want to honor you with our relationships with one another. We, we want the church uh, we as the people of God to, to reflect you and that people would see our love for you in our love for one another. And so bless us, Lord, uh, to this end. And Lord, for these people that uh, have been mentioned on these cards, the concerns, and we just lift them to you and we pray that you'd bless each one, that you'd bless the families, bless those who are sick, those who are traveling, those who have important decisions to make. Uh, that in all of these things, Lord, that they would see your guiding, loving, gracious, and merciful hand. And Lord, now for our time together, this is your word we're about to hear. It's not mine or that of the congregation or that of the church in general, but we want to hear from you. We want to hear what your word has to say about our life together. And so, Lord, give us wisdom and guidance, we pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, this morning, we are just about done, I really do promise, with our study in the book of Romans, when in Rome, don't do as the Romans. And so we're remembering once again what God expects of his people in the midst of a secular world. And so what he expects of you and of me and our life together in particular. And so today we're looking at what we might easily call, as you'll see in the moments to come, navigating troubling waters. Now, we're going to be looking at Romans 14, and, and actually we need to take this as a unit because it is a unit. There are a whole lot of things here, so we're going to get rolling and we're going to run a sprint through this, but there are times in our life together when there are troubling waters. And that is to say that we're not always in agreement with one another. And so we're trying to hear what God's Word teaches us about how to get through these troubling waters, but get through them together. 
and to get through them the way that God would have for us. And so we're looking at Romans 14, but we're going to look at particularly as we start right now, verse 17. This is kind of in the middle of it all, but here is a guiding principle that overarches the rest of them, so we need to hear it. It goes like this, for the kingdom of God... <coughs> excuse me, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now let me put it another way. I'm not trying to take away or minimize what this has to say, but early on in my Christian life, I had a dear friend, and I uh, didn't identify him in the early service. His name is Mel Stewart, and he was a businessman in Clary, and he helped to, to get uh, Christian and young people from the college together. And we happened to be one time looking at this particular passage, and there were some things that I didn't quite get. And, and he said to me, he said, Ron, the problem is in the church that sometimes people major in the minors when we all should be majoring in the majors. And what he meant by that is pretty much what this verse has to say. We forget that we are kingdom people, that we belong to him, that he's Lord, and it's his reign in us that counts. And sometimes we get all hung up about these little things that we fight over, that that's what gets the attention. That's what takes over. And so we end up being divided over little things, the minors, when we should be focusing on the majors. So, there was a little boy. He happened to be Baptist. And he was playing with his little girl friend who was a Methodist. And one day as they're playing together, the little girl said, well, friend, why don't we play church? And, and he said, well, I, I think so, but let me go check with my mom to make sure we can do that. And he went and he talked to his mom and he came back and he said to her, I'm sorry, we can't play church because my mom says we belong to different abominations. <laughs> Sometimes our divisiveness is an abomination. Sometimes the way that we focus now, now I, I know that we all have some distinctives and I praise God for them, but there are, are things about which we must agree that are at the core of faith. But there are other things that, you know, we might not all agree on, but we need to love each other and work together anyway. So here's what we're focusing on today. The principles that you're going to see or guidelines that you're going to see are guidelines for handling disputable matters among Christians. Now, you see the underline there? The word that's underlined is disputable matters. Now, please hear this. Not everything is disputable. There are absolutes. There are indisputables about which there is no compromise and upon which we must stand firmly and without fail. But there are thousands of things that are disputables. And I say thousands because it's amazing what we can fight about. I mean, I mean, a debate about, excuse me, did I say fight about? I did, didn't I? And it's amazing how we can divide over the things that are so incidental about which there's not certainty. Now, now please, again, remember, there are indisputables. There are things that we absolutely must agree upon. Where the Bible is clear, we need to be clear as well. And so the Bible is absolutely clear that, about the way of salvation and that the way of salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. And that is through faith in him it has nothing to do with ourselves or about a particular abomination or denomination for that matter. But it has to do with our relationship with Jesus Christ because of who he is and what he has done for us. That is absolutely clear. The Bible is absolutely clear that God... Uh, is one God, but has made himself known in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that they equally share in the divine nature of the Bible. It's abundantly clear about that. Now, 
I'm not going to fight with you over the term Trinity. I like the term, excuse me, I like the term Trinity. I have no problem using it, but the term Trinity is not found in the Bible. And so if somebody says, hey, I don't like that term, okay. But do you believe what God has revealed about himself? Absolutely. That's what we cannot change. And, and the deity of Christ is abundantly clear, who he is and his true nature. And, and the list goes on. The authority of Scripture, Scripture itself upholds. And Jesus upheld that the Bible was the final authority for our faith and our practice together. And so the list could go on of indisputables. But today, we want to talk about how we navigate troubling waters. How we get along when we don't always agree. And so we're going to look at this passage. This is where we need to start a sprint together. But we're going to look at the first four verses <clears throat> and where we see the teaching of accept without judging. Now, hang on. Uh, now, more often than not, we're kind of like the picture up there. We're beating each other instead of, but we are to accept without judging. Now, now why do I say that? Now, let's listen to these words. It goes like this. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything. Another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. So what's the principle here, the guideline for getting through troubling waters? It has to do with accepting each other. Accepting each other and doing so without judging in disputable matters. Now, now, we all need to study the scriptures and we can encourage each other sometimes. You know, the iron sharpens iron sort of thing. We help each other along. But we still, when we don't agree, accept each other without judging indisputable matters. Now, apparently in the early church here, the situation that Paul was addressing is that early Christians were having debates over eating certain things or not eating certain things. They were having trouble as the passage unfold over drinking certain things and not drinking certain things. And then we'll see even a little later on, they were disputing over which days needed to be set aside as special days and days for, for worship. And some would say it's one day and some would say it's another. But we need to take it into our present day because it's not just about the troubles of the past. We need to hear the same kind of guidelines for the disputes that we have today. And so we need to accept without judging even about styles of worship. Now, did you hear that? Styles of worship. There are some people who come to the early service who would not come to the second service. And there are those who are in the second service that want no part of the early service. And so we'll debate over styles of worship, but the question is, do we worship God? Do we worship Him? And sometimes we'll debate over we should, whether we should use a, a word like Easter or, or whether it should be PowerPoint in the church or, or not. And the list can go on and on. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of things that, that Christians get mad at each other over and don't associate with each other over. Disputable matters, but they don't matter because we're to accept one another without judging. That's the principle that is here. So, you know, whether you prefer organ or whether you prefer a guitar. Now, I just want to say that before the organ was ever invented, there were stringed instruments in the church. But just saying. But anyway, nevertheless, whether you prefer one or the other, the question is, can we worship God? Because that's why we come. We are here to honor him. It's about him. It's not about us. It's not about what we like. It's about loving him. It's about giving him first place. It's about recognizing that he is worthy. And so we come here to worship God. And so many years ago, uh, there was a battle between the French and the British. And it happened to be over Canada. And so there is, the, the, there is a ship. That's, and the admiral is Admiral Phipps. And Admiral Phipps is given an assignment by the British military that he is to sit in the harbor of Quebec. And his job is when the army, the ground troops, arrive, 
that he is to provide cover for them when they enter Quebec. The problem is he got there before the military did, the ground troops. And he's sitting there in the harbor and he's looking at the city and he is very disturbed by what he sees. And he sees that on top of many, many churches, there, there are saints that are on the churches. They were Roman Catholic churches. And so he gets so disturbed that he begins to fire at the churches to try to knock down the saints. This is a true story. And when the ground troops arrived, he was of absolutely no use to them because he had fired off all his ammunition. So, isn't that kind of like us in the church? I don't take this too far, you know, but, but isn't that like us? Sometimes we spend our time firing ammunition at one another, at the saints, when God has important assignments for us to do. And we're not about the assignments, but we're sure about arguing with one another. So, <clears throat> The next thing that this passage lifts up as a guideline, and you will not find specifically this word, except was in the passage, but this one I, I put the word, but I think it certainly represents act before God the judge. Now, here are the words, because these are the important ones from Scripture, verses 5 through 12. It goes like this. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Uh, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, what? We belong to the Lord. Pretty amazing. I didn't make this stuff up. This is in the Word of God. This is Romans 14. Now, it goes on. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. Uh, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I use the word act. But remember what the passage goes on to explain to us that, that we need to act by being convinced before God of the choices that we make, of our preferences even for our style, whether it's of worship or the days that we celebrate or don't celebrate. But here, notice this. that I, I, I added this. No, it says that we need to be fully convinced. That was the Bible passage. That means that we don't just do what we're going to do because that's what our parents did. Or we don't do what we do because that's what the Methodist Church says we ought to do. We don't do what we do because Pastor Ron said that's what you ought to do. Seriously, we need to be fully convinced before God that what we act on is of Him. Now, that doesn't mean that I hope it doesn't mean I'm always going to be wrong. I hope sometimes you will agree with me. And hopefully sometimes we're in agreement with the Methodist Church. You understand, though, we don't do things just because someone else tells us we ought to do it. We need to be convinced before God. We act before God the judge. And that's what is he here. We see we act then, or we live and act to who? Not to one another. We act and live before God. Now... This gets hard. I, you know, I, I would hope and I would want to, as a Christian, live my life before God and before God alone. But I, I confess it gets hard because, you know, I live with church people. And everybody has an opinion about how the pastor ought to do things and not do things. And sometimes I feel that pressure. But now I'm not saying I want to listen to you because you may be right sometimes. But I need to live and so do you. 
before God fully convinced that you're living right with him, before the judge. He is the only one that counts. So, also we need to remember, this passage says this, we belong to him. Now we're going to find out we also belong to one another. But first and foremost, we belong to him. That Jesus paid the price for your salvation, for my salvation. He died the death that we deserve. Uh, he, he, he died so that we might have life. And he then bought us with that price so that we belong to him. And he is Lord. Now, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, I've used this a number of times, this passage, but it says it so well. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than those Thessalonians, for they received the message with great, great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, why were they noble in character? Why, why were they recognized here? Is because they didn't just listen to what Paul said. They went back to make sure it was true from the scriptures. They wanted to be fully convinced that what he was preaching and teaching was so. And all of us, all of us need to have that same kind of personal responsibility to be fully convinced before God of the decisions and the life that we live, the way that we act. The next thing that we see in this passage is to allow for the judgment of others. Now, this is the one that gets really hard. So hang on. Now, I tried to represent it by this picture here that, you know, we all need to be walking. But sometimes some of us are in a habit of throwing the banana peel underneath uh, our friends in the church's feet. You know, we try to trip them up. And, and, and you know, I mean, it's, it's true, isn't it? Come on. Now, we, we all, there are some times where we do things that makes us feel good, not necessarily what's good for the other person. And sometimes, you know, we want to get them. Right? Don't, I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's true of all of us, but there are some of that out there. So let's listen to what the Word of God says that we need to allow for the judgment of other people. It goes like this, 13 to 21. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Anyone or as one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God... Uh, is uh, not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make what? Every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy uh, the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but what or but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Wow. So the last one we saw were to act before God the judge that, you know, we're responsible before him. But this one is actually tell us we're also responsible for the choices we make, the things that we do before one another. Because if we're hurting someone else's walk in Christ, even though we may have liberty and freedom to do it, we shouldn't do it because we should love our brother and sister enough that we don't want their walk with Christ to be destroyed by our own liberty. That's what this is talking about. So we allow for, uh, we allow for, make allowance for, to be considerate of other people and how our freedom in Christ impacts them. 
even though they may not feel the same way. That, and, and therefore, again, it's, remember, don't put something in their way that's going to trip them up. Don't, no stumbling block. And do everything in love, he said. Everything that we are needs to be about love for, for one another. And everything needs to be about building up. I said this a couple of moments ago, but it bears uh, repeating. If we are in a conflicted situation, troubling waters with someone else, and we're not sure how to get through, we need to be really, really careful that the way that we respond, if, even if we th think we're helping, if, it's, if we're saying something or doing something to, for somebody else because we want to make ourselves feel better, don't do it. If what we're doing is truly going to build someone else up, it's about their good, about their spiritual growth, about their walk, it's what's going to help them to be a better Christian and about a better servant of God and about fulfilling the mission that God has, has given to all of us, then by all means that we do it, but we do what will build each other up. Um, also, again, we, we said this at the beginning, but, you know, it's about the kingdom of God. That's the KOG that's up there, just abbreviated. It's everything is about the kingdom of God. That is about God's reign in you and in me. That's what matters. That's the major. Above all everything else, you know, can, are we doing what we're doing? Because Jesus reigns right here. And it's about his will and not ours. Now, Paul also wrote about matters like this when he was writing to Corinthians. And in chapter 8, verses 9 and 11, I skipped over a little bit just for the sake of time, but he, he was talking about eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. But we don't eat meat that's sacrificed to idols because the good news is we don't sacrifice to idols. But we do debate about certain things. And he says this, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So the weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Do we recognize that Christ died for the world? Now, not all have come to faith in him, but the ones who have come to faith in him, Jesus died for them just as much as he did for, for me and for you. And so we need to recognize that and make sure that we don't hinder their walk. Well, one time, there was a young man from a very small village in Scotland. His name was Donald MacDonald, not the other guy. He was Donald MacDonald. And, and in school, he had done exceedingly well. And his community knew about how, what a bright young man he was and how well he'd done in school. And they were so excited when, when this young man from Scotland was accepted to, the, to Oxford University in London, a very prestigious university then and even now. And so, and so they were all excited to send him off to study at Oxford. And, and so when time came off, he went and, and he goes to, to London. And, and you know, the community, though, that sent him, they were getting a little nervous because they're wondering how this young man was going to hold up in the big city uh, of London. So after a month's time, his mama decides to make a visit to him in London at the university. And soon as they got together, the very first thing that came out of her mouth as she approached him and she said, she said, uh, and just how are these English students treating you, Donald? And he got a kind of a sad look on his face. He hung his head down and, and he said, oh, mother. He said, they're such terrible, noisy people. The one on the one side of me in the room beside me keeps banging his head against the wall over and over and over again. And he just doesn't seem to stop. And the one that's on the room to my other side, all he does, it seems, for hours on a time is screams and screams and screams. These English students are just such terrible, noisy people. And, you know, with the compassion and the love of a mother, she's, oh, Donald, just how do you get along with such terrible, noisy people? And he said, well, I really do okay because I just sit here and as long as I can, I keep playing my bagpipes. <laughs> I like bagpipes and I like Scottish people. Don't, don't. I actually have Scottish blood. Well, anyway, the point is that sometimes we don't consider 
what we do and the impact that we'll have on other people. It's just possible I'm driving somebody crazy and don't know it. And it's possible you are driving someone crazy by the decisions and the things you do and you don't know it. So, you know, if you hear people banging their head against the wall, you might want to consider your bagpipe. Well, okay, anyway. <clears throat> Picture of the bottle. When I was an early Christian, uh, after really several months, you know, I, I confess that before I was a Christian, I had used some alcohol, some not mu much, but I had used it some. But when I became a Christian, it was an immediate conviction of my spirit that I, I, I would not use alcohol. I, you know, over time, I came to, to realize that the Bible did not condemn the use of alcohol alcohol, it did condemn drunk, drunkenness. And so that was very clear. However, I had a personal choice. That, and that was that I would never use alcohol. And, and Bonnie, when we got married, we both shared that same conviction. And we knew that God had called us into ministry. And one of the things that we decided is, is that we would never consume alcohol because that would potentially be a stumbling block for other people who might not understand the freedom to the right use of it. I'm not saying go do whatever you want to do because drunkenness is absolutely condemned. But we decided that we would just not touch it at all. And we haven't in the Christian life except once. And here's what happened. We were on a mission trip one week to Cuba. And while we were there, we worshiped in a Baptist church. Now, we didn't know much of what was going on because at that point, I knew next to no Spanish whatsoever. But I knew when it was time for communion. I could tell they were getting, and we wanted to celebrate communion with them. And, and as the tray with the cups for communion was approaching, I gulped because before it ever got there, I knew it was real wine. If some of you never knew this, we only have grape juice in the Methodist church. If you're coming here for wine, you're not going to get it. But anyway, it was, clearly, it was clearly wine on its way to me. And I had this principle of never drinking alcohol. But I figured, hey, I'm in Cuba. No. <laughs> You know, when in Rome, don't do that. Anyway, no. No, I was in church with brothers and sisters from Cuba in a Baptist church. And they celebrated communion with the liberty of using real wine. So we drank real wine that day. Uh, please forgive me if, they, you know, if that really bothers somebody. But, but I thought that was the right thing to do at that time. It was awful, but I drank it. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, so here's the point. You know, I'm not saying, to, you know, because the hip wells don't touch alcohol. You don't touch alcohol. But I am saying what the scripture teaches here, don't put a stumbling block in someone's way. You need to make choices like I need to make choices of the things that we do, the things that we believe to consider the impact on other people. Well, there's one more here. We're going to roll right along with this one. But approval comes from God's judgment. And that's the only stamp of approval that we need. We need God's judgment. And verse 22 and 23 at the end of this says, But whatever you believe about these things... Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who doubts is condemned if he eats because he, his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is what? Sin. So, in this passage... Uh, we see some very important principles. And I, wanna, I just want to wrap it together. I, I think at one point I told you the story before, but, but the, 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 the quote that I want to share with you is so significant, we need to hear it again in this context. And, and the man is uh, Rup, Rup, uh, yeah, Rupertus uh, Meldenius, and he was a little-known German theologian. That's where we'll put it at the moment. But, but... Uh, he lived at a time when there was a 30-year war going on in Europe and in his homeland of Germany. 30-year war. And the war was largely because of disagreements between Christians. Pretty tragic. 
But one day, uh, he wrote what became a watchword for many Christians ever since. And the words are, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity or love. Now, I don't want to leave out John from this, so let me say just two things from John Wesley. John Wesley wrote a sermon called The Character of a Methodist. It's one of his better known ones. And it is often quoted, as a matter of fact, the first quote is quoted a whole lot more than the second one. But I have two quotes from John, but I want you to notice that the one followed as a conclusion to the other, because we sometimes take people out of context. Imagine that. Well, anyway, John said, As to all opinions which do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think. Now, in our pluralistic, relativistic society, a lot of people want to seize that and say, hey, it doesn't matter. You believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want. But, but listen, he says, As to all things that do not strike at the root of Christianity. That is their core beliefs, that there are core things that we cannot compromise. But that's not all he said, because later on in the sermon, in his concluding way, he said this, we believe that the written word of God is the only sufficient rule of both the Christian faith and practice. If the scripture speaks, we speak. If the scripture calls for us to do, we must do. That is our final authority because that is what God has revealed. It's not my opinion or your opinion, but when God speaks, we must act. Let's pray together. Dear gracious God, Every one of us stands in amazement before you. We thank you for inspiring these words through Paul many years ago because we, we confess that we struggle with many of the same issues. We allow many things to divide us. But help us in the midst of disputable matters to follow these guidelines. Help us in the midst of troubling waters to keep the boat straight and to help one another to get safely together to the other side. Lord, help us to let your reign be over all that we are and do. To let your love be what is the priority of all of our relationships and that we would seek to know and serve you and one another. So that, Lord, when you give us that assignment, that mission, which you have given to all of us, we'd be about your mission. Love you and praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Jerome's going to lead us in a song, but, uh, you know, certainly there are many, many concerns that have already lifted up. But if you have a prayer concern, welcome to bring it the altar railing. But let's all give our walk with God and our walk with one another to the Lord. Amen. Make me broken so I can be healed. Because I'm so callous, now I can't feel. I want to run to you, the heart wide open, make me broken. Make me empty, so I can be filled, cause I'm still holding onto my
the darkness, I know you will hold me. Scriptures tell us, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's be Holy Spirit people. Amen.